All right. So, take two on this on this oh. album review. <laughs> Molly and I today are continuing to. <laughs> we're, we're talking about Paul Simon a lot. <laughs> we are uh, reviewing Paul Simon's 1986 album Graceland. The good news is I feel very passionately about this album, and I will talk about it. Literally ad nauseum until you are sick. <laughs> yeah, so I'll be taking my temperature throughout this video. <laughs> <laughs> um, Molly always talks about this album as being the perfect road trip album. It's the greatest road trip album. And um, I don't so, actually don't recommend listening to this when you're not in a car driving at least two hours somewhere. <laughs> Um, but you have to on make, a sunny day. But you have to make sure you do that at least once a year, so you can listen to this album at least once. Which is a year. yeah, also true. <laughs> um, so everyone should travel more. It's another tip from us. Adventures, I recommend them. <laughs> In this episode of a Michael review, Molly gives you a lot of homework. <laughs> <laughs> Look, I just think people should listen to more kinds of music. Yeah, yeah. All music is good. Like more things because it's fun to like things. I love liking things. Yeah. I like loving things to go. <laughs> Everything's the best. It is. It's, it's the greatest of all. Um, okay, so um, we just got through going through all these songs. Now we're going to do it again. Yes. But we're going to save a lot this time. Yeah, and maybe we can do it faster. Okay, so first track on the album is The Boy in the Bubble. It hooks you right from the beginning. But what I was saying earlier, like with that, with that um, the way it hooks you right at the beginning is with that accordion. Mm -hmm. And that's one of my least favorite timbres. Um, but it sets up the feeling of how this album draws on various folk traditions. Um, and the accordion is an instrument that you hear a lot in you know, many different kinds of folk music. It is definitely a folk instrument in the same vein as the fiddle um, or the acoustic guitar. Yeah, yeah. To me, the first time... I remember listening to this, hearing that and thinking, oh, I don't think I want to listen to this. And I'm, if, if you have that same feeling, yeah. like don't listen to the feeling. Yeah, no, listen, listen to this to whole the album. album and, then, yeah. and then fall in love with Afropop and Zydeco music. <laughs> um, which is what this album is really a gateway to. You yeah. know, it, it makes you want to um, dig deeper into the music that inspired this album. Mm -hmm. These are some this of the accordion, by the way. <laughs> these are some <laughs> of the most depressing lyrics on the album, uh, because it's about distrusting technology in a lot of ways, and like, look at all these wonderful things that we can do now, and look how awful life is. Um, and it's really, I, I think this is the sort of extremely negative output uh, outlook of this song. Is this is the only song on the album that we really get that? We get depressing songs elsewhere, but they are more on a personal level. This is oh, yeah. like a big societal yeah. thing. Then it goes to my favorite song on the album, which is Graceland. Um, this is probably part of why I think of this as a road trip album, aside from the fact of I heard this a lot in the car on family road trips as a child. But um, this is a song that is literally about a road trip. Mm -hmm. He is following the river down the highway through the cradle of the Civil War. His traveling companion is nine years old, and they're going to Graceland. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I think that this song has the best lyrics on the album. Yeah. Um, it tells a beautiful story. It's not my favorite, but I really love it. It's a good song. Um, it's one of... It, it's our second highest rated uh, with our scores between the two of us. Uh, it's one of the... Like, it, like half the album has a 10... Rating. Oh, we're going to Graceland. Anything else to say Memphis about Graceland? Tennessee, we're going to Graceland. <laughs> Anything else to say about Graceland? Uh, I just, I it really, it's my favorite song. And I, I want to talk about the lyrics for a minute because they're so beautiful when he says, um, well, he talks about the woman who calls herself the human trampoline, tumbling and turning. I said, oh, so this is what you mean. She means we're bouncing into Graceland. It's just so intricately written. And then it has, you know, these beautiful moments like, and I could say, ooh, and everybody would know what I was talking about. Like, and you do, you know what he's talking about. It's, um, it's masterful. It's really masterfully written song. Go listen to it. Yeah. All right. Do it. Track three 
I know what I know. But. We really get into that Afro beat um, with this one. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we've, you've heard it before. You hear that Afro sound in um, Graceland, but then it really leans all the way into it on this track. Yeah. And I, I, I like the choral... The chorus vocals mm-hmm. in this one a lot. You have like vocal percussion mm-hmm. where they're going woo woo yeah. woo woo, and it's not it's not meant to be harmonic or anything. It's really just a beat keeping, mm-hmm. um, but with a pitch, but with a pitch that doesn't seem to align with anything. Yeah, yeah. Um, this, this, you know, I think I underrated this song. Well, <laughs> and I think what's interesting is that um, the the lyrics to this song are in a totally different universe than the band is. Uh, because you're in <laughs> whoever is singing the song is in like some kind of cocktail party or something with the most insufferable pretentious people you know and then you have things like you know don't I know you from the cinematographer's party and wasn't he the one that was recently given the Fulbright yeah. and like all of this stuff and, and, and you could tell that these people like are just awful <laughs> are, are, are we the, those people at the party now? I, know, I, I hope not I would like to think that we're the people making fun of the other people at the party. We were invited, but we're not really one of them. <laughs> we, <laughs> we should ask, like, my roommate if we're the, if we are those people at the hey, party. Hey, Bob, are we the people at the cinematographer's party? <laughs> Let's move on to Gum Boots, which is um, also very Afro poppy. But it's one of the more forgettable songs on the album, I think. Um, um, until you hear it, and then you go, "How could I forget this song?" So yeah, so it comes in with that Afro pop guitar. The lyrics on this are, are, I think, generally not that interesting. I could feel you could love me, but I feel you could. Yeah. Isn't that this one? Yeah. Yeah. I, I know that he was working on this song before he went to Africa mm-hmm. and brought it to um, some musician, like played it for a musician there. And he's like, oh, okay, that sounds like one of our songs. Let's just jam on that and I'll throw in things in our style. And the, the, I think th- I think this song is really like the genesis of the album. Yeah, this it it has this song has some grooves on it. it. It's it's a very lyrically driven song. It's one of those songs where the lyrics feel very conversational, which a lot of Paul Simon songs do, especially on this album. Um, and the, he, they sort of spill out of his mouth really rapid fire. Yeah. So don't count this song off. Don't write it off. It's still just, it's still just not one of my favorites though. Moving on to my favorite song on the album, Diamonds on the Soles of Her Shoes. Yeah, and I think um, we both agree that this is kind of the heart of the album. Mm-hmm. This is the first time on the album that we get to hear Lady Smith. Lady Smith, Black Mombazo. <laughs> <laughs> Which, you know, I'm trying to imagine hearing it for the first time because I've literally heard this album my whole life. I think, I think it came out in what would you say 1986 86. so I was two years old <laughs> so I literally grew up with this album um and I think I think I'm trying to imagine what it would have felt like to have heard the sound of Lady Smith Black Mombazo doing backup vocals for Paul Simon and ha- having never heard that kind of music before I mean yeah. it, it was really revolutionary and then uh, I, I wonder like Lady, Lady Smith Black Mombazo. I said it so many times correctly the last yeah, time. Lady Smith, Black Mombazo. Um, I I wonder what it was like to people watching Mean Girls for the first time when they're thirteen and hearing the joke about that Katie's parents um, have concert tickets to go see them. Well, like, does that make sense to anyone? It made sense to me because <laughs> um, my parents were probably not that different from Katie's parents in yeah. Mean Girls, and um, I I. I never did go see Lady Smith Black Mombazo with my mom, but I did see Sweet Honey and the Rock with my mom. <laughs> <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> Does anybody know what Sweet Honey and the Rock is? Okay, go look them up. <laughs> that's but that's barbershop. That's women's barbershop. Yeah, but it's still it's the same kind. It's the same people like the same thing. The roaches. My mom was really into the roaches. Um, it's a whole. It's, it's people doing harmony. I really love the lyrics in this one and how uh, the, the way the story works, mm-hmm. how it starts off just comparing these two characters, the poor boy and the rich girl. And the rich girl wears diamonds on the soles of her shoes and it's like, she has so much money that she's even walking on it because she doesn't care. She it, 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 um, doesn't even care if you can't see it. Um, and then by the end of the song, 
Oh, and the, but then Molly brought up the um, point of when they talk about his shoes, mm-hmm. it's in a really great line. Yeah, uh, he says the poor boy changes his clothes and puts on aftershave to compensate for his ordinary shoes. And it just, it feels so authentic and real to me when you hear that. Like, I can actually imagine somebody who's feeling insecure about themselves doing just that. Yeah. And I think it's really nice how the shoes of these two characters are just a metaphor and how she's well healed. But then also by the end of the song, when it talks about how they, they're going to go out, but they end up just falling asleep in a doorway and with diamonds on the soles of their Their shoes. shoes. And then in the very last verse, it, it, he, he talks about diamonds on the soles of his shoes, but then it means something else. Yeah. He's still not rich, but he yeah. feels like he is. Yeah. <laughs> I also think that this is one of the more sort of melodically driven songs on the album. It has it undulates a little bit more instead of just having words spitting out of your mouth, um, fitting into a chord progression. Yeah. Yeah. I think the rest of the album revolves around this song. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and then this is in the old days of sides. This is the last album of the fir- the last song of the first side, and then we get to the first song of the second side, which is the song everyone knows from this album. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's they save it for side two, mm-hmm. um, which is wild to me. Yeah. <laughs> but let's go on and talk about that. Yeah, you, you, you can, can call, call me Al, Al. Um, Betty. When you call me, you can call me Al. This song um, is obviously iconic. That tr- the horn lick is unmistakable. Everybody knows, and everybody does the same. Because we all saw Chevy Chase do it mm. in the music video, um, and it's interesting. I mean, I would say that that it's a horn lick as icon as iconic as the like Sweet Caroline, you know. Um, but we both agreed that there, there there's a horn section in Diamonds on the Soles of Her Shoes. That is maybe better. <laughs> Actually, maybe many of the horn licks in the rest of this. I mean, album this one really are is simple, but I think yeah. the simplicity of it is what makes it so catchy, right? And makes it stick in people's brains. Um, and that's why this was chosen as the lead single from the album. It's the most palatable, not palatable. I mean, I guess palatable, but it's the it's it 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 obviously would appeal to the widest audience. Mm-hmm. And that's not at all a bad thing. I also, I think people overlook how intricate and beautiful the lyrics to this song are. um, And how they fit in with that overall texture. Um, You know, we talked about, um, you know, he he looks around, he finds himself in a strange world. Maybe it's the third world. Maybe it's his first time around. And when it does that, it's, it's almost... You know, that intricate wordplay that almost is like hip hop, you know, where, I mean, it's obviously not, but it, it's, it, it's doing that same kind of like repetitive, but twisting it, turning it on its head kind of thing. And then, um, and then it does that thing where, you know, you have that boom, boom. Oh, oh. And so you have him, he says, you know, he looks around, around, he sees angels in the architecture. This is my favorite part of the song. He sees angels in the architecture spinning to infinity, and he says, angels, hallelujah. And it's just such a great, it's a good moment. And I, have, I have to break for a little anecdote here. Um, a couple of years ago, a couple summers ago, Molly and I went on a little road trip. A little road trip to New York City. On a to, bus. Yeah, to see a friend's show. So we took the bus off and, and the bus on the way down. I don't recommend it. <laughs> on the way back, we were on a double-decker bus. We were sitting on the on upper the level. On the top level, with the windows going up over top of us. Mm-hmm. And it was way too hot because the AC was broken. And it was a very hot summer. It was like 100 <laughs> degrees outside. <laughs> I, I, I had bought a headphone splitter jack so that we could both listen to our own earbuds from one phone. Very important when you're on a road trip on a bus. Yeah. So we were listening to Graceland, and I was, it was hot. So and I believe it was my idea too. It was like, <laughs> probably. We have to listen to Graceland because we're on a road trip. <laughs> um, and it, it was hot. We were both kind of zoning out. I was like doing my own thing for a minute. Then at one point, and I think it was during those lines, I look over at Molly. Then she's just like blissed out. Hi, it's interesting that you remember that it was that song in particular because I didn't catch you taking that photo, and I didn't see the photo until I think maybe a day later. Um, because he did take a photo of me being blissed out listening yep. to the song. Um, so do you remember taking the photo specifically during this song? I think because I think 
right after I took the photo, I commented to you on how you're blissed out right now. And then you then you went and gave me that same lecture about that The line. angels and the architecture. Yeah. It's so good. Go listen to it. When was the last time you listened to this song? <laughs> you have to go. Stop this right now. Go listen to the song. We'll wait. Okay, so that is You Can Call Me Al, which transitions so beautifully to Under African Skies. Um, we suddenly hear... Linda Ronstadt. Yeah, and the, the inclusion of a woman's voice at this moment is so perfect and so needed. And she sounds like a freaking angel. Yeah. She sounds glorious on this. I mean, they, people always talk about how Linda Ronstadt could do literally anything. Yeah, she, <laughs> fits, she fits in any style. Yeah. Have you ever seen that like weird movie of her in Pirates of Penzance? Um, Who she play? She's Mabel. Oh, is that, is that the same one with Angela Lansbury as Ruth? Okay, this is a tangent. <laughs> Linda Ronstadt can do anything from Pirates of Penzance to... <laughs> You're no good, you're no good, you're no good. <laughs> yeah. To a Paul Simon album. Yeah. This isn't the most intricate or incredible song that Paul Simon's but ever written. But it's sweet. It's so Everybody sweet. Everybody likes it. Yeah, it's Try so Try nice. not to sing along. <laughs> Duet with your spouse. Yeah. Or your cat. We need Trey if you could teach, you could teach your cat <laughs> one of the parts. <laughs> um... I love the imagery in this song about um, his path was marked by the stars of the Southern Hemisphere. It's so specific. Mm -hmm. People forget that you have different stars when you go below the equator. Yeah. When we talked about the song before, we, we, we briefly wondered whether these were the same two people from Diamonds to the Souls of Issues. We quickly but, realized they're not. No. Because <laughs> it would be very unlikely that this, this girl who seems to have grown up in pretty poor circumstances would then be the girl who has diamonds in the soles of her shoes unless she's Annie and was adopted by Annie, uh, by Daddy Warbucks. What's next to talk about? Homeless is next. Oh yeah, so the, now we have Lady Smith Black Mombazo um, basically leading the show. This is really showcasing them and what they do um, which is these thick, rich harmonies that and you know that are punctuated with these incredible sort of vocalisms that I don't think anybody who's used to listening to so-called Western music he hears very often. Yeah, so you have Lady Smith Black Mavazo singing this sort of call and response um, music um, with these rich harmonies. And then it's the way that it is structured is sort of a very, it, it's similar almost to a certain American folk musics, which of course are, are deeply influenced by the music that was brought by enslaved Africans. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Paul Simon really takes a back seat here and, and sort of blends into the harmonies. You don't really almost notice that he's singing right. until um, maybe a little bit later in the song when it becomes a little more uh, rhythmic. Um, and then you have those sort of fascinating vocal percussions again, mm -hmm. where they do that. They do this thing that I, as a child, I always used to try to mimic because I was always fascinated by it, where they do that eh, 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 <laughs> with that, with that breath and that glottal, um, action, um, and then they also do those, brrr, the, yeah. those like, um, I'm I'm just fascinated by all of it. And when I was a kid, my mom actually had a like Lady Smith Black Mambazo album that had a lot more of this stuff. If you're fascinated by what you hear on this track, you should go listen to it because it's really interesting. Crazy Love is a song that is I think one of the more forgettable tracks on this album. Um, and and it's a shame because. The lyrics at the beginning are so good. Mm. We've got Fat Charlie the it's Archangel. It's a switch. <laughs> but like when you say Fat Charlie the Archangel slopes into the room, you know exactly yeah. this what this character looks like, yeah. and, and you can picture them. Is. And then when it, it, a little bit more information is added, like the first time we hear the, um, I don't know a thing about that. Mm -hmm. Like coming from that character tells you even more about what that character is like and it's like okay, okay cool i'm gonna learn about this interesting character that i can see in my head right now and then the rest of the song just kind yeah, of yeah I, I i do think that the, the like the chorus of this song is kind of boring i mean paul simon's boring is i think much more interesting than most people's interesting but when you, you know i don't want no part of your crazy love um it's it's fine um, it's kind of forgettable, but I always love it when it comes back around to Fat Charlie the Archangel files for divorce, yeah. you know? Um, 
it, that that's that's the heart of the song for me. And then there's like this other part that I don't care to listen to. Yeah. But you mentioned something about the, how it changes keys. Yeah. That um, the other redeeming quality of this song is how each time when we get to uh, uh, the the crazy love parts, we change key into it and then change key back out to the verses. And I. It really feels like it exists in two different universes, and I think that's why it always feels so jarring to me. Mm-hmm. Um, it feels like it should be two different songs. <laughs> Maybe. Almost. Yeah. That Was Your Mother is, I think, the dark horse <laughs> of the album. <laughs> you, and we're you... not talking about Katy Perry. <laughs> <laughs> we're never talking about Katy Perry. It's never Star Trek. <laughs> it's never Star Trek. <laughs> um, you forget that it's there. And then it comes up as you're listening to it while you're driving on your trip to the beach or wherever you're going. Maybe it's the mountains. Maybe it's your... <laughs> Maybe it's Graceland. I would prefer the mountains. (laughs) Um, And this song comes up with that. This song is pure Zydeco. So we've had like hints of Zydeco. We've had hints of Afropop. We've had things that sort of straddle the line between the two. Um, And then you get to this pure Zydeco song talking about being on the corner of Lafayette in the state of Louisiana listening to Zydeco. Um, So it's a Zydeco song about Zydeco music. (laughs) And it is so fun. And I'm going to give you more homework because you should listen to Zydeco music. <laughs> Go get a compilation album. Listen to all the songs. Dance your face off. <laughs> do it on Mardi Gras. It has this song about being so full of life, having such a wonderful time, meeting a woman, falling in love, having a kid, and then everything gets boring. And you're <laughs> longing for that time when you had the freedom, when you weren't tied down by these obligations of family life. Yeah. And you could be a traveling salesman going yeah. to Zydeco bars. And you are the burden of my generation. But I sure do yes. love you. <laughs> I, I promise. I promise. I still love you. Um, but really, though. <laughs> you, could, you could picture a, like a, a drunk father saying this to his kid. And yeah. the kid being like... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, anything else on this one? I could picture my dad saying that to me. <laughs> my dad does love me very much. And I think by virtue of being divorced and living several states away, I was not that much of a burden on him. <laughs> um, so that probably helped. <laughs> Anything else Dad, if you're watching this, I love you, and I, I don't have any ill. Like, I, I, I'm really, this is not a thing. <laughs> don't stress. Mom, you too. <laughs> All right, then we come around to the last track of the album, which is All Around the World or The Myth of Fingerprints. And mm. It's fine. It's the most forgettable in this album. It's a shame that this album doesn't have a stronger close, but I think by virtue of having one of the weaker songs on the album closing it, it kind of makes you want to go back to track one and do it all over again. Yeah, I, not necessarily for me, because like I I am more inclined to do it all again if it has a, a really good song at the end. Yeah. Um, it's like I'm always like, oh, this, that song wasn't as good as the first song. I want to I want to go back to the first song. <laughs> yeah. And then the second song. <laughs> and then the third song. <laughs> yeah. And it's it's not a bad song. Um No, and I think it um I think it tells kind of an interesting an intricate story. It does it does that thing where it says you know, uh, there's a former talk show host and then it says something about a former army post. I think that's an interesting rhyme and I always for some reason I always picture Phil Donahue whenever I heard this song. <laughs> Whatever happened to him? Did he die? Is he dead? Is Donahue still alive? Do you if remember Donahue? If you're watching Phil Donahue. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now we can do some closer talking about this with some things about the whole album. Yeah. Um, so we can talk about the cohesion of the album. Well, we can talk about how it marries these sounds of Zydeco music, Afropop, and then the Zulu, Lady Smith, Black Mombazo mm-hmm. um, aesthetic. And then the typical American folk stuff. Right, the, sort of what you think of when you think of Paul Simon right. as a songwriter. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I, it, it all works really well, and it's to Paul Simon's credit. It's also not to, like, you know, throw a party for someone when they do it right, but, mm-hmm. like, thank God he credited everyone properly. Right. Um, yeah. I mean, well, and I think he did something that actually highlighted these kinds of musics um, that are really the creation of, of black and brown people um, instead of stealing it. He really, he involved these musicians in the making of the album um, 
and and put their names on it and said listen to this Mm -hmm. this is interesting what they're doing is good yeah um and exciting yeah that's if you're if you want to do something like that make sure that you are talking with the people that you want to share ideas with yes involve them and credit them make sure you're paying them yeah (laughs) (laughs) um can we talk about just this album as just a road trip album yeah yeah because i I talk about this all the time but you have to listen to this album in the car on a sunny day with people you like that know all the words and that want to sing along with you um i had the privilege a couple of years ago of actually listening to graceland on a drive to graceland (laughs) um and that was a lifelong goal of mine which i have now achieved (laughs) I have this really vivid memory from when I was, God, I was probably no older than seven. And um, we went on a drive um, to a, just a family vacation. We borrowed my grandmother's Volvo for this trip. And um, at some point over the course of the trip, we were like looking for music to listen to because the radio stations started to get fuzzy. And um, my grandmother had about... 12 different recorded cassettes of Garrison Keillor's A Prairie Home Companion <laughs> and one album of music, which just happened to be Paul Simon's Graceland. And we listened to it over and over and over and over again. And that's probably where I learned every lyric to this entire album um, and have known it ever since. But I do, I, like, we were listening to it over and over again, but it didn't feel like a trap. It didn't feel like, oh my God, could please make it stop. Like, we wanted to keep listening to it. And I remember having discussions about, you know, Call Me Out. And I remember us doing the horn thing yeah. with the song and um, singing along with Linda Ronsett's harmonies. I know my family all loved my singing when I was a <laughs> child um, and encouraged it. <laughs> um, but, yeah, I, it just, I've always thought of this album as one that you listen to when you're happy, in the summer, on a sunny day, when you're driving someplace fun. Mm-hmm. And I think it just it just has such happy memories with me for that reason. And, yeah. And, but I don't think my love for this album is purely rooted in nostalgia either. I think it is so good. It's really masterfully composed. Well, and, and that's part of why I was making you look at each of these individual pieces of things. But even when I do, I all I hear is excellence. Yeah, but and it also sort of that ties into my idea of when we're looking at all these individual things, like talking about the melody of the song, the rhythm of this song, the meter of the song, even if you give, you know, average middling scores to any or all of those, you can, it can still be a great song despite all of the individual because pieces. Because the song is greater than the sum of its parts. Or I guess it conceivably could be worse than the sum of its parts too. Oh yeah, definitely could. <laughs> <laughs> So before we went through and gave them um, individual scores for all these little minuscule parts, we each gave the the album a score out of 100 that we thought it deserved. Oh, did I? Yeah. Oh, I said, yeah, I went back to 95. Yeah. You talked me down from 100. (laughs) Because I I think there's no such thing as a perfect album. I think it's perfect. (laughs) Well, it's not. But then I said, okay, there's at least one track that I tend to skip over. Yeah. um, And that's probably Fat Charlie the Archangel. (laughs) And... um, and then the rest of it is perfect. So I, I bumped my 100 down to 95. Yeah. Sorry, Paul. I still <laughs> I, love you. I gave it an 85. And um, I, I and I do actually still really love this album. <laughs> I'm not really into giving numeric scores in general. You wrangled me into this format. <laughs> I would rather talk about it in a very subjective way. And, and it, when I'm doing that, I mean, I already have done that uh, over the course of this discussion. And all I, all I have... Is good things to say, right? But I like how in and what we're saying, the 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 words we're saying are more important than the scores we're giving, and um, but I like how there are things that the first time we went through before it crashed, pointing out the spots where our scores differed and why we thought that way brought up some interesting conversation. Mm-hmm. True. That that was really the main reason for all of this. Also, we're just friends, and we usually have interesting conversations because yeah. we just get along so well. We're also we, intellectually on the level. We have interesting conversations if 
you can understand what we're talking about because a lot of our other friends complain that we're, they never We're it. like the people at the cinematographer's <laughs> party. <laughs> okay, so then if we look at what the numeric scores gave the album, gave it, it puts it at an, an 87. That, Still only a B plus. Then if we combine all of those, the, the, the scores that we thought the album deserved plus the scores that our numbers gave it, that gives this album an 89%. Which I think is fair. I think it deserves an A+. Plus. <laughs> Let us know what you think of any of the things we said. What you think of this album. Um, I'm trying to foster more conversation through all of these things that we're doing on the Remichael Facebook and on our YouTube. Um, so please do comment and respond and like and... Do all these things. And, and dance for us. And watch and... Chevy Chase go... Ba, ba, ba. <laughs> and then um, report back to us with uh, 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 write us a report on all the homework that Molly gave you and she'll grade it but she won't give you an numeric score <laughs> no. no I'm just going to give you a smiley face or a frowny <laughs> it's probably going to be a smiley I would say that um, you're so interesting that not even the birds out this window will distract me from your your conversation <laughs> Uh, 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 uh,